What's the separation, right? Uh, who likes his bank to be offline? I mean, we're in an amazing time where like, um, actually I had this a while ago that there was a system, I wanted to look something up and they were like, no, well, this weekend it's, well, we're doing a maintenance. Like, you're doing what? A maintenance, like all week and long? First of all, for people that have to work on a freaking weekend. And second, what? I mean, come on, we're in 2019, right? Okay, so looking at how to build systems that are resilient to failure and hopefully that don't have a maintenance window um, are not easy to build. I guess all of you understand we're not going through like a full dive in like how to make a system that is never ever to fail, it's never offline. Uh, we're, we're only having 45 minutes, not 45 days, right? Um, but uh, what, what I want to do is to give a short overview of topics that you definitely want to read up on. Um, giving you some links in the end, like here are some interesting blog posts, some articles, some, some tools that people use to make these things happen. So, uh, but I think first of all we need to figure out what does that actually mean? What, what are we talking about, right? So we're talking about modular applications, most of the time built out of microservices. Who's does microservices here? Oh, I see some people like, yeah, maybe. Okay, uh, do we need to define micro? <laughs> like function as a service micro? No, right? Um, but, so most of you guys are still working on those like large monolithic, oh, poor people. Oh, wh why are we here again? <laughs> no, just kidding. But uh, modular application, I mean, you can have multiple monoliths working together. It's still micro, it just depends on how you define it, right? The second thing is continuous integration. I hope that everyone now raises his hand, right? My continuous integration? Ah, uh, well, there's still some people like, ah, maybe. Unit tests? I'm still not all hands up. What are you doing all day long? Drinking coffee? Beer? <laughs> <laughs> you're, oh, you're raising your hand all day long. Okay, gotcha. Okay, um, continuous deployment, anyone. Just one hand. Okay, there's one hand, two hands, three hands. Wow, four, five. Oh, you're. That's actually a pretty good number for for the amount of people. Wow. So, how do you do the uh, continuous deployment? How often do you deploy? Whenever we want. I like that <laughs> answer. I like that answer. Who knows how often Facebook deploys a day? 50 to 60,000 times. Per day? Yeah. I heard a different number, but that would be super impressive. <laughs> I heard something in the thousands, but whatever it is. So a even if it's a thousand deployments a day, that's more than one deployment a second, or roughly one deployment a second, right? That's like super impressive. Often people, when you, when you talk about continuous deployment, they're like, how do you do that? Like, what happens if something breaks? First of all, we have continuous integration, don't we? We had our hands up. Sure, we have continuous integration. So most of the failures should already be stopped before they're actually being deployed into production. And if something really bad happens, like a Facebook game isn't loading anymore, <clears throat> um, we, we just fix it. Or if we can't fix it right away, we roll back to an older version. It's, it's literally that simple. And to be honest, it also works for banks. Maybe not in the system that actually transfers the money, um, but you would be surprised how simple those systems are sometimes. I heard a story about a PHP script transferring 90% of all the money in a bank. I didn't want it to know which one because I was scared it was mine. Um, but uh, on, the, on the web front, then, it just doesn't matter. Just keep it deploying. Small changes are simpler to fix and simpler to find uh, errors than a major deployment every three to four months, right? Okay, so who am I to talk about that kind of stuff? Um, I'm actually a senior developer advocate at Instana. Uh, we have this like lovely robot. Um, unfortunately, I forgot to take a couple of squeezy stands with me. Um, doing Java for a lot of years, I just stopped after like 10 years counting because that's the level where you start feeling old. Right? Um, so it must be over 15 years by now. Um, I'm doing a lot of Go and TypeScript during the last couple of years, which is super weird, um, but it's okay. Um, and when it comes to Java, I most, most of the time look at anything related to performance. 
Uh, so resiliency is just a side note. Uh, most of the time it's performance related. And my personal favorite are benchmark fairy tales. Any idea what that means? Who believes NVIDIA is faster than AMD? Who, be who believes AMD is faster than NVIDIA? Who believes it just depends on how you run the benchmark? Exactly, right? This is me uh, from a more technical perspective. Uh, I'm the master builder, at least that's what I'd like to believe. Um, I think we're all believing we're master builders, right? Um, there's a couple of languages that I really like. Um, Java is still one of those, but I'm doing a lot of Kotlin is, uh, right now. Um, there's a couple of languages where I like, well, I kind of like Go, um, but I hate Python with passion. There's, <laughs> I heard poo. Uh, there's three bad P's, PHP, Perl, and Python. Um, <laughs> and JavaScript, that's the fourth P. Uh, however you want to make this happen. And well, we're Germany, right? So obviously I love you. Most technical fact. Okay, resiliency. Uh, I think we need to define resiliency first. Um, I love this quote. I actually just, I, I wanted to find something that explains it. And you put it into Google and it gives you the answer right away. It's like, awesome. First of all, it's 178 million answers. Like, oh my goodness, right? And then there's this like one simple, very nice sentence. The cap uh, capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Toughness. I, I, I like the semicolon. Toughness. That's, that's beautiful. But, okay, so the capability to recover from problems, from situations which are, un, which are not nice. And when we build applications today, we often go back to these like puzzling systems, frameworks, call it whatever you want, right? We're taking a couple of components, we're plugging them together. Who's using Spring Boot? <coughs> Not, I haven't said anything. There's an example for at least every single language that I know. Even PHP has some frameworks, a lot of them. And we're not talking about JavaScript, right? Um, uh, but we're, we're taking those components and building an application is like super easy today. And I'm not saying frameworks are bad, right? They're actually super nice and they're very good at giving us a good platform that we can build on and build our application. And we're doing that in pretty much every language. And I could add Erlang, and I could add Clojure, and I probably could still add COBOL. <clears throat> I'm not sure, does COBOL actually have a logo? Was that fancy in the, in the what is it, 70s? No, probably not, right? Um, but we're, we're, we're using a lot of different languages today. And from my perspective, it's, it's good. Take the right tool for the right job. Not every programming language is. Uh, gives you the, the same tool set, the same capability for building whatever you want. If you're doing machine learning, you probably have to end up using Python, if you want it or not, right? Because that's where all the scientific um, development goes to. So they have a lot of frameworks for, micro, uh, for machine learning and everything AI related. Um, if you're being not like, well, how to say that? If, if you don't like yourself, if you hate yourself, you can go with PHP. Well, it's, to be honest, the newer PHP versions are not as bad as the old stuff. Um, if you really want to shoot your, uh, yourself on the foot, you can go with Scala. Scala developers? You all understand, a couple of years ago, that looked completely different, right? Everyone was like, boo, boo, call the stage. Um, Kotlin, but to be honest, if you're going for a simple, oh, uh, um, uh, for, for simple web app, uh, APIs, REST APIs. Go is amazing. I wouldn't use it for anything else though. And I said I'm doing a lot of Go at the moment. But when we look at databases, we have the same thing. Who's using more than one database type today? Ah, there you go. Can you imagine how that looked like 10 years ago? What would be the general answer 10 years ago to, I need a database? It was relational. There was nothing else, or there were a couple of, but nobody used them, right? These days we have graph databases, key value stores, we have document stores, we have still relational databases, and they're super important, don't get me wrong. Um, you have all those different things, column stores, right? And same thing, use the right thing or the right product for the right job. If you have a time series database, uh, if you have a time series you want to act on, like log data, metrics, whatever, use a time series database. If you have something which is a lookup cache. 
use the key value store, right? If you have payment data, please store them still in, in relation to databases, please. Especially when you're working at my bank. Um, and the third thing which completely changes or changed in the recent future is deployment environments. Who's, who's deploying bare metal? Okay, two. Who's deploying virtual machines? Who's deploying containers? What, what does the rest do? You don't deploy at all? <laughs> <laughs> it runs on my machine. <laughs> it runs on my machine. Oh, that's good. I like that answer. Right? But um, a couple of years ago, we didn't even know what containers are. Now it's like half of the room is like, yeah, we're using containers. And it's important, right? And same thing. Use whatever works for you, right? Uh, the only thing, please don't run databases in containers. Uh, I just had this discussion this morning on Twitter. Don't do it. It's a pretty bad idea. His answer was that, yeah, I want to use it for integration tests, but are you running an Oracle database on your local machine during development? No, right? So you have virtual machines for testing. Just use them, whatever. You can run, a, from, from my perspective, databases are not a thing for containers because it's like super hard to get all the environment right. Um, ask the guys from Neo4j, uh, they put two years of their life into it and I think they pretty much gave up and went back to virtual machines. So, um, resiliency. Uh, we have a well-oiled uh, well machine here and it just works, right? And it's super convenient because everything wraps together and like, yeah, yeah, it just works. Except for when it doesn't. Especially the, the, the more we go to distributed microservice based environments, the more or the higher is the chance of one service actually failing everything. A common example would be a user service. You need to lock in somebody to actually make the system available to the user. If the user service is gone, well, at least your latency goes down and probably error rate too, right? As long as people can't do anything, that's all good. So the problem is we want to prevent this kind of stuff from happening. And when we talk about resiliency, a, a simple software failure is not the only thing. There's a lot of cool stuff that can happen. And when I say so cool, I actually mean it. There is power outages. Thankfully, they're not very common these days, at least not in the, well, developed countries, if you can actually use this term. Right? It's, it's very uncommon in Germany. Uh, it's less uncommon in the US, but it's still uncommon. Most of the time being hit by a typhoon, um, a tornado or whatever. So it happens as well. Um, for other countries, it's more common to not have power than to actually have power, which, well, you probably wouldn't build a data center in that kind of environment. Okay, so power outage. The second thing is hardware failure. Um, I have no idea what this person did, but it looks fantastic. It's, it's a beauty of art, isn't it? Like chaos theory in one, in, in one term. So hardware failure, um, that is a very extreme example, but uh, there is a lot of disks being exchanged every single day in Google data center. Uh, there is a lot of SSDs being exchanged. There's a lot of network cards, CPUs. We love to think of hardware as something that just works on us, um, but if you, if you run in a high-scale uh, high environment, that is normally not the case. So hardware failure is a common thing, and the, the way you, uh, what, what you can do is, well, redundancy, obviously, right? You, you don't have a single machine running. Um, I, love, I worked for Hazycast for a long time, and I love when people came to us like, yeah, we have a Hazycast cluster. We're actually running 20 nodes on a single physical server. Like, yeah, that is exactly what we're meaning with the cluster. Don't do that. Um, and the third one is network failure. Um, a network failure can be a lot of stuff. We're just making our networks more complicated, right? We have physical hardware, switches, network cables. We have SDN, software defined network. We might have VPNs in the middle. Um, in the worst case, I don't know, somebody is killing the network stack on the machine we're just running on and all your virtual machines, all your containers ha don't have a connection anymore, right? Those are stuff that actually happens. Um, or this stuff that actually happens, actually quite a lot. Um, we're in Germany, so you guys probably know Hexna. 
the cloud and well hosting provider. And I think two years ago they had the problem that somebody pushed a new version of the firewall configuration, which literally just killed the whole data center. And your only hope is, well, it, 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 it was an apprentice. It was an apprentice. And that would be the question, like, why does an apprentice push firewall rules? But yeah, whatever. Human error. And there's so much wrong with this picture, right? There's so much wrong. Um, first of all, uh, it's only halfway through. Then there is like a strap actually keeping both versions together, it's closed on both sides, so it doesn't make any sense at all, right? There is so much stuff, and that is a perfect example of human error. Um, but there is a lot of human error, and I'm not free of it. As I said, I like to think of myself as a master builder. I know I'm not. Um, I'm doing mistakes. I'm doing a lot of mistakes, and if we're honest, everyone does, right? Um, I can remember a time when I actually executed a SQL command because somebody forced me, like, can you quickly do that? Just just quickly, it's super simple, right? You just need to delete something. And you're like, delete all from, like, fuck. You can't imagine how hot you feel or how hot you get when it, the result set says, well, affected growth, 1.56 million. You're like, oh my goodness, right? Human error, and long story short, don't act on, it's just, and can you quickly do it? Don't do that. It's like the worst idea. And the last one, we already had that software bugs, right? It worked on my machine. Um, we all know that. So what could possibly go wrong? Nothing. We're, we, we just had a couple of exceptions from the general rule that nothing can go wrong. So how do we actually build resilient applications? From my perspective, there's a couple of different stages. Stages for me are like the teams that actually have to act on it. Um, first of all, and that is from my perspective super important, it's a cross-cutting concern. Resiliency is not something you push on developers. It's not something you push on, engineer, uh, on, on, on operations or anyone else. It's a cross-cutting concern all the way up to management. Because if you can't get your management on board to actually build a resilient environment or a, 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 um, a redundant environment, you're out of luck. You can give up right away, right? So it's, it's literally cross-cutting through all of the different um, stages, all of the different hierarchies on a, uh, on, a serve, uh, on, a, on a company. So obviously, we're the first ones. Uh, they're good developers. Um, that's what I at least look like my, most of the day. Like, gosh. Why is it not working? Um, then there is the operations people that or DevOps in in you English, right? DevOps um, that get my code after I kind of made it to work somehow, and I pushed it, and we're like, oh, right? And then there is like the last person, you know, like in a data center, everything runs for them. Data centers never go offline except for AWS zones. Right, I was like, was it two year, a year ago? Uh, where a whole AWS region just went offline for half of a day. I'm like, oh, wait a second. You mean you lost half of a data center just like whatever happened? Good Amazon, right? So even if you're running in the cloud, it doesn't save you. Even though people just like, oh yeah, for us it just works. So, some basic rules. Right, so we, we have like the three main stages. So now we need a set of basic rules. As I said, we unfortunately can't go like super in depth because it takes way too many, too much time. Um, my first rule would be automate everything. As as long as we're, the more you automate, the easier it is to recover from a failure. Uh, there are some companies. Um, so I'm running a small startup uh, myself um, next to Instana which also does that because I like the idea. You have a single command line tool which literally can set up a whole infrastructure from a single command, right? You're like, whatever, CLI, initialize, and you give it a cloud provider or whatever. And it goes to the backups, if you have some, it goes to the backups, redeploys the database, um, pushes the, the backup to the database, 
uh, sets up the, the Kubernetes um, system, um, it deploys the first uh, containers that are necessary, it installs stuff with home charts, and it literally spins up the whole environment in, well, about two hours. So a fully automated process in two hours, can you imagine what that would be for fun to do this manually, right? <sighs> like, get some coffee. But, but seriously, automate everything. Um, I often, or people sometimes ask like, what do, you, what, what do you mean by automate everything, right? Where, where is like the threshold? My threshold would be everything you have to do at least twice is probably coming back to you. I know that sounds like super harsh, like automate everything you have to do at least twice, uh, but you will thank yourself later when you have to do it like a, half a year, a year later, and you're like, ah, how did I do that? Uh, let me see. Uh, and for me, this is like two weeks ahead, right? Two weeks later, I have no idea what I actually did. Like, because I literally don't want to remember the commands. I figure out how it works, I automate it, and there you go. So the second thing is no single point of failure. We already have it, right? Redundancy, 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 redundancy. I could make the Steve Ballmer, redundancy, redundancy, but that would look stupid. Um, but seriously, um, don't have a single point of failure. For, for me, that goes even beyond a single cloud provider. Right? I already said Amazon had an outage of whole region. Sure, you can go for multiple regions, uh, you can go for multiple availability zones, but still you might want to go a little bit further even. Right? In the worst case, for some reason, AWS gets completely cut off the network because some apprentice pushing firewall rules. Right? If you have your system deployed to, well, not naming the second vendor here, but Google, or Microsoft, Azure, um, you're still good, right? You have literally like no idea what actually could happen. So try to prevent single point of failures. And for databases, if you have a database that can run as a cluster, do it. Cluster means at least three nodes, three physical machines, right? Um, 20, 20 nodes on a single physical machine don't bring you any, or don't give you anything, except for extremely low latency between the nodes. There you go. There's a reason for that, and that was actually their reason. <clears throat> um, but um, if you have a database, a more traditional, relational one, go for master, slave, master, follow, whatever you want to call it these days, right? Um, have a hot standby, something which pushes every single change to the, uh, to the, to the uh, redundant system, and when something happens, you switch a flip, or if you flip a switch, you can also try to switch a flip, um, uh, a peanut flip, obviously, um, and you're still good to go, right? You're probably having an outage of a couple of seconds. And in the best case, you automated it, and whenever you figure out the one database is gone, you just automatically flip it. The third rule is, and probably the most important one, embrace the failure. And that means you, we have to be okay with understanding we can't make a system which is not going to fail. We can do everything to prevent it, but it will still fail at some point in time. He's like super in a hurry to see that. <laughs> um, right? So the, mo the most important thing to actually understand where systems can fail, where something can go wrong is if we understand, hey, we can't make a heavy world and that's okay, but we can try to prevent it. When we think on on the wrong side. Like um, unit tests. Who's writing bad unit tests? Who's writing non-happy world unit tests? Stuff that actually tries to break the system. You see that's like four or five, well some people are like, yeah, the hands are going up, obviously I have to raise it too. But it's, 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 it, it should be like all of the room, right? At, at least all the people that have their hands up for unit tests. But, um, it, it should be a common thing. When you write unit tests, you're not taking the happy world into production or you're not have, taking the happy world into perspective. You're actually trying to think of what can go wrong and how can I prevent that. Um, even worse for, for integration tests. So when you embrace the failure, you can literally do everything. And believe me, you're going to like that. Right? You can literally do anything. That's, that's like super scary, right? 
I don't even want to know which la country ex that is exactly. It's certainly not Germany. <laughs> Maybe the US, I don't know. And the last thing, and that's rule number four and the most important one, when everything works at any point in time, have a beer. Because it's probably not take long until something breaks. Right? So, so when, when something works and like, yes, yes, every, every system is up and we're good. Go quick, go to the fridge, grab a beer. It's probably gone by the, by the second you actually opened it up. Okay, so I think we have to hurry just a little bit. So from a developer's point of view, what could we actually do? And the first thing is circuit breakers. Anyone heard of circuit breakers? I mean, not the non-technical ones, right? Not those. Okay, some hands go down. I mean, the software circuit breakers, right? Okay, still, uh, some hands. The, the idea is the same, right? Um, you, you try something, if it fails a couple of times, well, so don't go for the first time, but if it fails for a couple of times, you, you flip the switch and you're either going to a backup system, to a redundant system, or you're telling the user, hey, something went wrong, um, the user services is not active right now. Uh, please try it again in a couple of minutes. In the best case, a couple of seconds because we're, we're like super resilient, we're recovering from problems in like seconds, right? Um, some systems actually use multiple circuit breakers being chained to each other. So you're, you're trying the first system that doesn't work, you're trying the redundancy system that doesn't work either, and then you're like, hey, sorry, but we're totally out of luck. We only have two instances, so, um, we, we, we fucked up, right? Um, don't use that exact phrase when you tell the customer that something is wrong, um, but you can go in, in, in details, right? Don't tell them, like, unknown system error. Don't do that. Tell the user, hey, the server, the, the account system is not online right now. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, we have, what, what I really like are those systems, like, we have, we have automated monitoring of the systems. We already know there's an error. Uh, we're working on that. Uh, please try again in a minute or in 10 minutes. The second thing is use time budgets. And that's like super important as well. It's, it normally goes together with circuit breakers. Time budget means you have an overall response time of a max of, for example, oh, I, I forgot to fix it actually, um, 250 milliseconds. Uh, your first circuit breaker is behind backend one or before backend one. and it's a timeout of 100 milliseconds. That's the thing that I didn't fix. So it's a timeout of 100 milliseconds. You say, okay, the backend number one doesn't respond in 100 milliseconds. We just call, we just cancel the request. We're going for the second one. Uh, we'll give it another 100 milliseconds. Um, if that doesn't respond, yeah, well, give, give the user some, some response, right? Don't just let like this amazing internet information server 500 non saying anything error message just fly to the user. Try to give some context of what is actually going wrong. But time budgets are super helpful, as I said, especially with circuit breakers. The third one, and probably never heard of that, back off algorithms, anyone? Okay, one person, um, two, exponential back off maybe? Maybe that's, okay, there's some more hands. Right, so exponential back off algorithms, back off algorithms, whatever you're gonna call those, are, um, Something that we all know, who, who, are, who had to access um, an API at some point in time, an external API from somebody else. Okay, so there's more people. You understand how rate limits work, right? A number of requests per minute, per hour, whatever. That's some kind of a back of algorithm. So you're telling the user, Here, here's your budget. That's what you can do. And then you have to go away. Uh, for backoff algorithms or exponential backoff, that's more like internal services. So you have something which creates data and you want to push it somewhere else to another service. The other service is completely overloaded right now for whatever reason. So the service tells you not only, hey, I couldn't process your request, it also gives you, hey, please try again in 10 seconds. So you're trying again in 10 seconds and the service is like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm still overloaded. Please try again in 20 seconds. Right, so you're, you're, you're slowing down the process. It doesn't always work because you can't just slow down every kind of producer, but often it works. And whenever it works, you should definitely do that because there's nothing worse than hitting an overloading ser uh, overloaded service with 
more requests and hitting it even harder because every single request that fails and is going to be retried makes the thing, situation even worse. So back off algorithms are one of the most important things ever. Um, immutability, our lovely topic, especially as Java programmers. Most of you are Java? Yep, okay. So we all know immutability is awesome. Uh, we all know the garbage collector hates us for doing immutability. Um, that's, that's mostly a Java problem in the way that objects work. Um, but believe me, it's not as bad as we think as long as the object never leaves the method. So if you create a string object and won't leave uh, the, the method that actually created it, it will be allocated as a char area on the stack. So it's not as bad as we think. Um, still, for people coming from Erlang, from whatever, um, 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 give me the hint, uh, what's Erlang is a uh, functional programming language. Very good, thank you. A functional programming language, um, they only think in immutability terms, right? Because they can't mutate state except for have some weird combined language like closure, but in, in a pure functional language, you can only create new values. And that gives you the, uh, uh, the possibility or the, um, the advantage of saying, hey, I always create new values, so I can literally just share them between threads, between, well, in the future, fibers, between whatever, because it's, the shared state will never actually change. So they make sharing states super, super simple. Um, and immutability often goes super nicely or hand in hand with uh, identity, well, identity. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people haven't heard that, right? Who knows what it is? Oh, oh wow, okay. So you can, or you can translate that as retriable operations. So re it's, it's a way of marking an, an operation, a request or whatever, with some unique ID, with whatever, that you can actually figure out, hey, I already executed this request. What is this useful for? Well, imagine you send out a request, the server processed it, but for some reason the connection was cut off before you actually got the response. So the only chance is either you, you ignore it, and you're like, yeah, happy world, nobody cares, right? Uh, or you retry it. And imagine you, trans uh, you deducted a bank account of a thousand euros and you retry that. That's nice. At least if you, if you add the balance to my account, right? But what you really want to do is you want to be able to retry. So that's what transaction ID is for. You generate a transaction ID, you add it to the actual transaction and you send it out again. And if the the system on the other side actually processed your response, it can figure it out like, hey, I've seen this transaction ID, and yes, I actually, ex ex actually executed the operation on it, so I can just ignore the second retry. And maybe you, you send back the original response, or in the worst case, you're like, hey, that's, that's a retry operation, I did this, it's, it's all good, whatever. Right, but it's important, you need to have retrieval operations. Uh, for systems that can fail, because you have, as, as we've seen, there are so many ways on, on a system to actually fail. And the only, and in a, in a distributed system, and microservices, let's be honest, is nothing else in a whole lot of different uh, distributed services or just distributed systems, um, there is no exactly once delivery. There is databases claiming it, and they still don't buy it exactly once is just not possible, except, except for you're using some kind of identifier to say, hey, yeah, this transaction was already processed. If we go a little bit further on stage two, uh, we have operations. And you remember, it's a cross-cutting concern. So on operation side, we have things like load balancers. It doesn't matter if it's software or hardware. It mostly implements the, the point of no single point of failure. That goes not only for the systems behind the load balancer, but you guessed it, for the load balancer as well, right? Don't, don't run a single load balancer. If you're running in a cloud, that's good because the, they never have a single instance of a load balancer, at least that's what I like to believe, um, right? I hope they don't, uh, but I'm pretty sure. 
And the other nice thing for a loop balancer, and that's something which I really like, is it just doesn't matter where I route this traffic to. I can route it to a bare metal machine in my own data center, which probably runs virtualized machine or virtual machines, right? So that's good. Um, and most of the traffic can be handled by the cloud. Or I do it the other way around. Most traffic is handled by our own data center for simplicity reasons, for um, price reasons, whatever. And when there is a lot of load, we're just spinning up some stuff in the cloud and, and, and routes and traffic as well, right? Like, yeah, that's our overload area, pretty much. Um, so from, from my perspective, a lot of that is one of the first things that should be in front of any system that kind of acts to the outside world. And it should also be used between services. There's cool stuff like service meshes, like Istio and stuff. Yeah. I'm still 100% wrong with that. It, it works, but um, it's a little bit more complicated from my perspective, especially because if you, Istio is obvious, right? Everyone knows what Istio is, like this cool service mesh in, that runs as a sidecar in front of every container. The nice thing is every, every connection you do looks like a localhost connection because the sidecar actually captures that connection, routes it somewhere else, and all the black magic happens. The problem is what happens if Istio is a problem? If something goes wrong inside of the service mesh, how do you figure out there's a bug in Istio if everything looks like a local host connection? I could actually say that Instana has a solution for that, but that would be commercial, so we're not doing that, right? So you haven't heard that. Um, but yeah, load balancers is an important thing. It doesn't matter how you do it. As I said, no single point of failure, and I just love this movie. By the way, any, anyone knows what movie that is? You can scream it in German because I know the German name too. Yep. So somehow holiday is something random. Uh, almost. I don't know English. Yeah, Griswold Chris, a uh, family Christmas. So if you like the family Griswold, um, they have a lot of cool movies. They're old, but I'm old. As I said, plus ten years job, so I'm old. Um, brilliant movie. Um, that's a perfect example of a single point of failure. Um, do backups. Backups are awesome, right? Who's doing backups? Or which company is doing backups, right? <laughs> so some people have their hands up, like, do you do backups? Yes. And if, is, does your company do backups? I had this down. <laughs> I didn't mean time machine backups, right? Backups. So people, hands up. Which company is doing backups? Or customers, if you work as a consultant? OK. Who's trying their backups to be replayed regularly? That's only, wow, that's scary. Um, what if I told you that a backup is only good if you, if you try it, right? Um, as I said, from my perspective, that's a good automation task as well. Just try to replay the backups like once in a while, once per month, whatever. Just doing automated tasks and if something goes wrong, hit some red light or whatever, right? Just make sure that people are saying, hey, the backup isn't working and we need to figure out what, why? right now because if we need the backup and we can't replay it there's something really bad going on but it's it's scary how many people or how many companies are doing backups but never ever try to actually rebuild something from that um, and from my perspective a lot of well unfortunately their relational databases are way ahead of most of the competitors um, if you have a system that can do point-in-time recovery, that's like super brilliant. Like Oracle, Postgres, stuff like that. Point-in-time recovery means that you can literally back up or restore your backup from every single statement at any, any point in time. The way it works is you take a snapshot and then you have the uh, write-ahead lock just being streamed to the same uh, storage location until the next snapshot happens, you throw away the old write on write ahead locks and then you just keep the new ones. You can literally go back to every single statement based on the statement ID, which is just blowing my oh, it was blowing my mind when I figured out that Postgres can actually do that. Because up to that point I was like, oh, that's an Oracle, IBM, everything expensive kind of thing. But no it's not. So infrastructure cloud, we're on the third level. Um, as I said, uh, go on-prem, go cloud, it just doesn't matter. In the best case, you go both ways. That's my personal feeling. I'd like to have some hardware which, well, does not belong to me, but is dedicated to me. 
Um, in the worst case, just for performance testing. Because I hate to do performance testing on AWS. It's brilliant. You can use the same version over and over again. You get different performance results every single run. It just doesn't work. So if somebody has a benchmark and claims, yeah, we ran this on AWS and it's not the dedicated machines, don't trust that benchmark because it doesn't tell you anything. Right? So, um, but we actually have a couple of systems running, uh, most specifically the one that do the machine learning because they eat a lot of CPU cycles. That's dedicated hardware. We only spin up a couple of uh, cloud instances when something goes wrong or when we need more, more CPU time, more CPU power. Now we are normally going for Azure, but that's just my personal preference. Um, Everything else runs in the cloud, all the, all the front end, whatever. And we're actually literally doing multi-cloud, right? Um, and we deploy on Kubernetes. Um, I'm not a big fan of Cloud Foundry, but that's personal preference. Um, I, was, I was burned like very early in the process, so I would say that's personal preference. But the, the interesting thing is if you, if you deploy to Kubernetes or you use Chef, Puppet for virtual machines, something like Ansible, sorry, Ansible, uh, for something like that, um, it's super easy. It doesn't matter if you actually run on a virtual machine on the cloud, if you run on a dedicated host, if you run on on-prem hardware, if you try to deploy a Kubernetes, uh, a, a container into a uh, managed Kubernetes, right? It just all works. And that's the beauty of it. So adding a little bit of abstraction is actually nice sometimes. Uh, as I said, Istio, from, from my perspective, sometimes a little bit too much of an abstraction. Um, it's, it's super convenient for the developer, from operation point of view, it's like super bad. Um, use regions, we already had that. Use multiple AWS regions, use uh, Azure failure zones, I think they call it. Um, not sure what Google calls it, probably Google zones or goggles, whatever, I don't know. Um, but the important thing is go for multiple regions. Don't just run in one region. As I said, AWS had a region outage. And that's like impressive. I mean, I don't know how many systems, physical systems make up a single region, but that's like super impressive outage. Um, and go for multiple clouds. I already said that as well, right? Uh, multiple clouds are nice. Um, have your private cloud, which is on-prem, for example. Um, you normally deploy to, to uh, I don't know, a, uh, Azure if something goes wrong or if you need a little bit more capacity or maybe uh, you have customers in a region where AWS is not strong, where the connection takes too long, you might want to go for a, uh, a separate cloud provider. Maybe even something which is not on the slide, uh, Alibaba. If you have customers in China, you most probably want to go for uh, the Alibaba cloud, which also offers Kubernetes, right? It's beautiful. You're, you always have hosted Kubernetes and you literally don't have to think about how to deploy that stuff because the deployment is always the same thing. You might have to think about how to secure the data being sent for out of a different story. Um, and my personal favorite example, I was bashing a, 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 a AWS so far. So who remembers that? The DIN DNS outage, right? It was it two, three years ago? No? You don't remember this day where half of the internet was not reachable because there was a, a massive, what is it, seven point something teraflop, uh, terabit, 1.2 terabit, per second, DDoS on the DIN DNS DNS servers. And it was interesting to see how many companies relied on a single DNS service to actually resolve their IP addresses. The scary thing is, some of the websites that still worked were on the safe for work site. So it seems like those companies do something very good and, and do something very right. I don't know why. Uh, but if you're going for the non-safe for work stuff, they are normally like super, super good in terms of technology. Plus Netflix. Plus Netflix. We have to say that, right? Um, it, it depends on how you categorize Netflix. Maybe there's some no safe for work stuff. I mean, HBO definitely has that. Game of Thrones. Um, but here is a little bit of a warning. I said some abstraction is nice sometimes. Um, and I put some things here like physical host, hypervisor, Kubernetes, um, Docker, SDN, sidecar, container, and I could go on forever and forever and forever. And it's just more stuff, right? 
can you imagine how hard it is to figure out if something fails anywhere in the stack, right? It's like, it's nice, but there's always a trade-off. And I think it's important to understand, same as embrace your failure, it's important to understand what this trade-off is and where you, put, where you draw your own line, right? Don't make things more complicated. Um, we all know it's like nice term kiss, like keep it simple, stupid. Um, that goes here as well. Um, and from my personal experience, I try a lot of things and I, I actually use what works best for me. It doesn't always have to be like the super awesome recommendation, uh, except for rule number one, automate everything. That's like, that, that's like the, the border, right? That's the threshold, you have to do that. Uh, but everything else, if Kubernetes doesn't work for you, go with um, Pivotal to the Cloud Foundry or go with OpenShift, go with whatever you want, it just doesn't matter. But, but figure out what works best for you and try to um, make all systems equal. Don't, don't have, or not equal, not equal is not the right term. Try to handle all the systems the same way. That's probably a better way, right? Kubernetes abstracts a lot of stuff from us, uh, which on the upper level makes it look all the same to us. It doesn't matter if it's run on Google, if it runs on AWS, if it runs on on-prem. That is the level of abstraction we want. A single system that we can just deploy to pretty much everywhere. And with that, I'd say, as I said, there's a lot of stuff. Um, there's a few really, really good read-ups, um, not only on those topics, but also a lot more. Um, uh, there's a lot more stuff as well. Um, I think these slides will be uploaded afterwards. I definitely upload them to SlideShare, uh, but I think they will be somewhere in the website as well. And with that, questions. No question, come on. Somebody's being brave. Okay, let me come up with the question then for you. Hmm. So, what would you say a resilient uh, application needs that I missed? Anyone? Is there something that you think I missed? Because I actually want to add it and, and just claim I never forgot about that, right? Monitoring. Monitoring. Good point, yep. Um, as I said, I didn't want to make this a commercial, so, yep. <laughs> um, but we can actually do a lot of those. Um, from infrastructure to pretty much everywhere. Um, if somebody wants to, to get a demo, uh, feel free to come afterwards. Um, but yeah, monitoring, it doesn't matter if it's in Stana or anything else. Monitoring is super important. As I said, if you have a system at monitoring, you remember this claim like, hey, we have automated monitoring, we already know about your failure uh, because we captured it and we're working on that. I, it's not just a phrase, I mean it, right? Monitor the systems, try to figure everything out. In the best case, before any user is, is like impacted, in the worst case, let the user know, yes, we captured it, uh, we have some monitoring in place and we're going to fix it right away. Anything else? Monitoring, good point. Uh, monitoring is not enough, maybe there should be also an alert and a notification. Okay, well, yes, monitoring is probably not enough, you should have alerting. <laughs> good point. Uh, don't just monitor stuff, uh, send out SMS, send out uh, emails, uh, have some red light. Uh, who knows the rocket launcher, the USB rocket launcher? That's brilliant, I love that. Right? Just, just send some rocket launching through, through the office. Uh, it doesn't work on weekends, but um, you should have someone on standby, just standing in front of it in the worst case. Yeah, good question. How do we handle log files in a distributed environment? And that's actually a complicated thing. So most people would say go for something like Logstash, um, Splunk, whatever, just send them all to a single server. And you're probably being very good with that answer. Um, I think the harder part is not actually storing all the logs, but how, what do you do afterwards? And that is where the integration between monitoring and lock systems come into place. Um, and Splunk is trying to do something like that. Um, lock, Lockstash, I think, has some solution for that as well. Um, they, all, they definitely can do some alerting, like you can make some phrases or some regex saying, okay, if that shows up in the lock file, please send me some alert. Or if it shows up a couple of times, like threshold more than 10 times in 
in a second there is something wrong. Um, what we have in Stana work on right now is a more generalized event handling system, so you can literally just push information from it. It will be open source, so no commercial here. Yeah? It will be open source. Um, you can literally just push information from any kind of system and you set up some rules. Uh, you can combine information from multiple systems and set up some rules. And for example, restore Kubernetes container, send out some alerting, which includes more than just one system, stuff like that. That would be, I guess, the best answer to that. Log files are super complicated, and I would normally claim don't rely on log files. At least try to stay away from them as much as possible. Um, health metrics or health checks are a good, good way of getting around log files in, in general. Especially it's beautiful if one of your colleagues changes the error message and nothing works again because you had some regex. It's all stuff we've seen before. This, does that answer the question? Perfect. Anything else? Yes. Yeah, interesting point. So what he said is they not just deploy stuff when a system fails, they're actually killing space and redeploying just to get the practice, just to understand how it works and what could go wrong. Um, and that's actually a very good point. You remember I said Netflix? Um, who knows Chaos Monkey? Uh, perfect. So Chaos Monkey is a tool that was created by Netflix engineers, actually chaos engineers, or chaos testing engineers. And the whole point of that is to, well, you could say fuck around with the system in every single possible way. It means killing services, it means hawking memory, it means whatever. Making the service struggle. And they normally had this running against their test environment, which was good because that worked out great for them. And we could say a, an apprentice again. An apprentice unfortunately hit this, uh, the life system with Chaos Monkey and killed about one third of the life infrastructure. The impressive part about that, nobody realized. Right? No customer was impacted. So that is how resilient you can become with this whole system. It's, it, Netflix is super impressive. Not saying use the Netflix stack because the API is shit like hell. They are definitely not API designers, but they understand how to build resilient systems. And that's, that's super important. So yes, good point. You could actually automate that. Uh, there is a great tool which is called Gremlin, uh, which is, I think, ex-Google and ex-Netflix engineers doing exactly that. Uh, crack, well, what do they call it? Case as a service, I think. Uh, it just randomly kills systems to figure out if your system is still working. Uh, I think there was another hand somewhere here. No? No? Nobody? How was it? Okay. Thank you very much.